I will be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Don't judge so that you won't be judged. You'll receive the same judgment you give. Whatever you deal out will be dealt out to you. Why do you see the splinter that's in your brother or sister's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your eye? You deceive yourself. First take the log out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother or sister's eye. Don't give holy things to dogs, and don't throw your pearls in front of swine. They will stomp on the pearls and then turn around to attack of you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And let us pray. God, we are thankful for your presence with us this day, and we ask that as we hear your word, it would shape us into the people you call us to be. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Don't judge lest you be judged. That is one of the famous sayings of Jesus, and I would argue it's one that even non-Christians are very familiar with, right? We hear that a lot these days in our world where there is a lot of controversy and rancor. A lot of people are saying, just don't judge. In fact, a lot of people see Christians as being uh, some of the most judgmental people in the world. There was a book recently uh, done by the Barna Group, which is kind of a, a survey group where they surveyed a bunch of young adults, and the title of the book was called Unchristian. And what they discovered was that nine out of ten young adults rated the church as being judgmental, Christians as being judgmental people. We live in a culture where people want to be able to do their own thing, and the prevailing wisdom seems to be live and let live. That's none of your business. Leave that alone. Don't judge me. That's the way we think. And some Christians have responded to that by, by kind of moving in the opposite direction. Now, it's true that there are some Christians who are very judgmental, who will protest and hold up signs or, or do things like that. We think of a Westboro Baptist kind of situation or something like that, where judgment is a legitimate criticism for many of us. But I would argue hypocrites are not just found in church. That's one of the things people often say when, they're gonna, when they find out you're a pastor, they always want to talk to you about things, and they say things like, you know, well, I don't go to church because the church is full of hypocrites. And I always say the same thing, then you'll fit right in. Because to some degree, all of us, all of us are. Um, and and uh, that word literally means to uh, play a role. We play a role uh, that uh, hides our true selves in front of others. But some Christians have responded to this accusation of judgment by saying, well, let's not talk about this anymore. In fact, let's not talk about sin at all. Because if we don't talk about sin, then we don't have to talk about judgment. Sin and repentance are seen by these Christians as being too harsh. As long as people are good and nice and don't hurt anyone else, then who am I to judge? Remove sin, you remove judgment. And then everything becomes about tolerance. Tolerance of everything except intolerance. And the only sin is to insist that there is such, something such as sin in the first place. But is that what Jesus is driving at here when he says, do not judge lest you be judged? Well, I want to argue today that we have to read this in its full context. Not just the context here of these verses, but the biblical context about judgment and grace. In fact, I would argue that this idea that we should just eliminate any talk of sin, that's not even close to the gospel. It doesn't match the witness of Scripture, which from chapter 3 of Genesis onward shows us again and again that sin is serious business. In fact, this Christianity is more akin to something that uh, sociologist Christian Smith 
and his partner came up with when they were writing about uh, sort of the modern world and what, what modern people kind of believe, particularly Americans. And they interviewed young adults as well, and they discovered something that they have come to call moralistic therapeutic deism. It's the belief that goes something like this. A God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. And this God wants people to be good and nice and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and in most world religions. But the central goal of this life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when needed to solve a problem and good people go to heaven when they die. Christian Smith says that this is the new American religion, that it's really about feeling good, about being nice, not messing with anyone else, not allowing anyone to mess with us. No sin, no judgment, no problem. But if we read the Bible again, we see again and again that sin is serious business. The Bible talks about sin as slavery. We're enslaved to sin and death. And all of us need to be liberated from that in order to be made whole. All of us are subject to God and God's judgment over sin. Because if God is just, then God does not allow sin to run rampant in his world, but wants to do something about it. For too many Christians today, sin and judgment and redemption and the cross are simply not part of their construct. We think of moralistic therapeutic deism as being kind of an, uh, a new thing, but actually it's quite old. It goes all the way back to the very beginning. And in fact, uh, Richard Niebuhr, who was a great theologian, wrote in the 1930s about Protestant liberalism and said that Protestant liberalism's theology looks something like this. A God without wrath brought people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. And if you attend a lot of churches, that's the gospel that you hear. I'm okay, you're okay. We don't talk about sin here. But it's serious business. It's so serious that Jesus is not telling us here to ignore sin, either in ourselves or in others, especially in the interest of being nice. You know that the word nice does not appear in the scriptures? Did you know this? There's no Greek word or Hebrew word for nice. Instead, what Jesus is driving at here is the question of how we as disciples of Jesus deal with sin in this world while remembering that we are sinners ourselves. That's the conundrum. We want to deal with sin, but we deal with it from within because we ourselves are sinners. We're subject to judgment. God's judgment. Now, F.F. F. Bruce, the great New Testament scholar, said that in the Greek, the word judgment is kind of ambiguous. It has a couple of different meanings. In one sense, judgment means discernment. It means to discern between what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. That's good judgment, right? This is the kind of judgment that if we're good parents, we exercise for our children. We correct them when they are wrong. And we don't do it in order to condemn them. We do it as a way of correcting them, of bringing them back into right behavior, into right relationship. That it's loving for us to keep them from running amok. Even though that's difficult sometimes, particularly when they are toddlers, right? They, they go everywhere. That first type of judgment is the kind of judgment that keeps our society from anarchy, we have laws and people to enforce those laws in a judicial system. We have judges who mediate. And while that's not a perfect system, it helps to keep us in order. But that's not the kind of judgment I think Jesus is talking about here. The second dimension of judgment that F.F. F. Bruce reminds us about is 
judgment as condemnation. This is the kind of judgment that assigns people to a particular category, an us versus them, an I versus thou kind of category. It's the kind of judgment that may make a comment on someone's eternal destiny, like that person is destined for heaven or hell. It's the second sense that Jesus is talking about. In fact, in Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, Luke 6, it's the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus adds to this, don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Condemnation is what Jesus is prohibiting here. But if we unpack, unpack the full force of this teaching, we recognize that, that condemning a fellow sinner is a no-no. But there are ways of dealing with sin that are redemptive and that can help us and help others become shaped into the kind of people God wants us to be. People free from slavery to sin and death and made whole and new. So I want to suggest today that there are five steps for dealing with sin that are revealed in this text and some of the other ones contextually that will help us to judge in ways that are redemptive, that will help us to not be pharisaic, but rather to reveal the fullness of God's grace and love for us. So you might want to write these down, five steps. The first one is to recognize that the way we judge others is the way God will judge us. Hello, here we go. Right out of the gate. The way that we judge others is the way that God will judge us. Notice what Jesus says here in chapter 7, verse 2. You will receive the same judgment you give. Whatever you deal out, I like the way the Common English Bible puts it there. The, what, what you deal out will be dealt to you. Remember the golden rule? Actually, that appears just a little bit later in chapter 7 here in verse 12. What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, actually, Jesus expands that here. And it's basically saying, do unto others as you would have God do unto you. Wow. My standing before God is dependent on how I treat others. If we want God's mercy and forgiveness, we need to express mercy and forgiveness toward others. Jesus reminds us here that we are all in the same boat. Paul says in Romans 3, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means all. We all are in need of redemption. And I love what Greg Boyd, the theologian, says about that. He says that because of that, the Christian's job is to agree with God that every person you meet was worth Jesus dying for. That is something we should probably have tattooed on the inside of our forearms to look at every time we go to write a Facebook post or something like that, right? I mean, we live in a world of labels. We live in a world where condemnation is in the air that we breathe. It is there all the time. It's every time we, we listen to the news or we boot up our computer or we open a newspaper or a magazine. There's condemnation and critique everywhere all the time. What if instead of joining in the fray, we asked ourselves some basic questions first? To ask what if God thinks about me the way I think about others? Or what if God deals with my sin the way I deal with the sins of others? That is a realization that is breathtaking if we take it seriously. It's a realization that should put us on our knees instead of in a position of judgment over someone else. That leads to the second step, which is to conduct a rigorous self-examination. Now, Jesus uses some hyperbole here, which I love. Well, why are you worried about the splinter in your neighbor's eye when you have literally a log or a plank in your own? I want you to just imagine that, walking around with a log stuck in your eye. You've, you've got a problem, right? 
Jesus says, first, deal with the log in your own eye, and then you can help your neighbor deal with his or her splinter. See, it's impossible for us to condemn someone else if we are first serious and honest about our own sin. This is the equivalent of the modern saying, people who live in glass houses shouldn't be throwing stones. You know, we compare and contrast ourselves to others all the time. That's actually part of our original sin nature. If you think back to, to the very first uh, sin there in the garden, Adam and Eve, what's really their first sin? It's idolatry. They want to be like God. They compare themselves to God. And then they have two sons, Cain and Abel, and Cain compares himself to Abel, whose offering is more acceptable to God, and so Cain gets jealous and kills off Abel. We've been comparing ourselves to one another ever since. Judgmentalism is a way of saying, I am superior. But you ever notice that sometimes the people who are the most judgmental and condemning are the ones who in the end have the most to hide? We see it over and over and over again. Shakespeare put it this way. He said, he doth protest too much. Right? That's part of the problem. But if we see ourselves in the same boat as others, as slaves to sin, in need of redemption and rescue, then we're more likely to lead and to deal with others with compassion and humility. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 puts it this way, if we claim we don't have any sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from everything we've done wrong. If we claim we have never sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Ouch. We can never say we've got it all figured out. Sort of like someone going to AA realizes that from then on in their lives, they are always an alcoholic. Even if they've been beating the disease for years and years and years, they recognize that there's an opportunity for them to go back. And they begin every meeting by saying, Hi, I'm Bob. I'm an alcoholic. This is an opportunity for us in the church to be able to say that this place is AA for sinners. Hi, my name is Bob, and I'm a sinner. I got stuff. You got stuff. Together, we've got to find a way to deal with our stuff. Jesus calls us to humility, to confront sin by coming alongside a fellow sinner, finding healing together, removing the plank from our own eye, and then being able to help our brother or sister to confront sin by confronting it first in ourselves, to get real about our own stuff. But we do confront sin. That's the next step. We confront it, but we do so with humility and grace. In fact, Jesus says that confronting sin is really the job of a disciple, the job of the church. But there's a particular way we are to do it. If you spin ahead to Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18, Jesus gives us a model of how to deal with this when someone else is caught in sin. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and correct them when you are alone together. If they listen to you, then you've won over your brother or sister. But if they won't listen, take with you one or two others so that every word may, may be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. But if they still won't pay attention, report it to the church. And if they won't pay attention even to the church, treat them as you would a Gentile and a tax collector. Notice what Jesus is asking for here. Direct confrontation. Oh, we don't like that teaching. That doesn't work very well for us. Because what do we normally do when someone wrongs us or we see someone who is going off the rails in sin? We talk about that person to everybody else except that person. 
We gossip. We type nasty Facebook posts. We hammer them on Twitter. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Instead of going as Jesus commands and speaking face to face. Face to face is key. This does not mean, and Jesus would say this, I think, if email was part of what Jesus was about back in the day, I think he would have warned us, in parentheses, that does not mean write them an email. Because that's how we tend to do things, right? We want to avoid the face-to-face confrontation, so we bang out an email to someone. Well, if you think scripture gets interpreted poorly, imagine how your emails get interpreted, right? We do this back and forth to one another. We send long email strings explaining ourselves and, and getting the argument. There, I'm firing this one off. That'll get them. There it goes, and it comes back. Jesus says no. We confront in person with love and humility. We go to repeated attempts at reconciliation and restoration. No gossip, no slander, no triangles. And if we're rebuffed repeatedly, we take someone with us, we take it to the church. If none of that works, then we leave it to God. We treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector. Oh, but wait a minute. Remember how Jesus treated Gentiles and tax collectors? How did he do that? He ate with them and he kept the door open for reconciliation and restoration. There's no room in the church for indirect attack. There's no room for evil speaking, as John Wesley put it. Rather, we must, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, speak the truth in love and grow up in every way in Christ together. And that's really the goal, which is step four. The goal is to seek restoration and reconciliation. The goal is not simply proving that we are right, that we are better than someone else. It's about restoration of the sinner, reconciliation with God and with others. James puts it this way in James 5. He says, my brothers and sisters, if any of you wander from the truth and someone turns back the wanderer, recognize that whoever brings a sinner back from the wrong path will save them from death and will bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Bringing back the wanderer, not condemning them is the goal. Jesus says in Luke chapter 15 that there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than of 99 who don't need to. That's in the same chapter as the prodigal son story, by the way. The father who welcomes back the wayward. Confrontation without condemnation is the disciples' way of dealing with sin. We begin by dealing with it in ourselves, and we approach others in humility and love. And even if they don't repent, we continue to love them, even if we can't condone what they have done. Which leads us to the fifth step, and that is that we leave judgment in the hands of God. Jesus' warning not to throw pearls before swine is a reminder that you can't force people to repent. There will always be those who reject correction. Oh, and by the way, this also means that we cannot reject correction when it is offered to us as well. Sometimes we have to break fellowship with someone who is in sin for the sake of our own spiritual lives and for the sake of the church. But even then, we never stop loving people and praying for restoration and reconciliation. This is a hard teaching of Jesus. But Jesus doesn't call us to the easy way. The easy way is to let sin run rampant and watch it happen all around us. Watch it destroy communities and and families and so forth and never confront it. Or we deny that it even exists. 
But Jesus calls us to confront sin with humility and love, knowing that we have been saved from our own sins as well. You know, we're Methodists, right? Okay, just checking to make sure that uh, we didn't have some others show up here this morning. Although if you did, that's great. We're glad you're here. But, uh, but um, we're Methodists, so we should be good at this. Historically, we have been good at this. The early Methodist movement was grounded in this idea of gathering people together in groups called class meetings and bands where they could share with one another their sins, where you could ask the people in the group, one by one around the circle, what sins have you committed that you need to repent of this week and how can we help you do it? And most Americans hear that and they go, whoa, no, no, no. I don't want any part of that kind of stuff because that might mean I got to get real. Class meeting caused the Methodist movement to expand exponentially in 18th century England because people were finding wholeness and healing by confessing their sins one to another, by supporting one another as fellow sinners, helping one another to find freedom from slavery to sin and death. But within a couple of generations, the Methodists decided that they wanted to be more respectable and not deal with sin in such an overt manner. We don't want to inconvenience people or make them feel uncomfortable. So therefore, we just won't talk about it. And the decline began shortly thereafter. And I would argue that if there is going to be a future for Methodism, indeed, if there is going to be a future for Christianity, we've got to be as serious about sin as God is and be willing to confront it in ourselves and in each other to confront without condemning to speak the truth in love and spur one another on to perfection the truth is that this will never be a popular gospel talking about sin because most people don't want to be confronted with their sin I'm not always happy when I'm confronted with my own. And yet, that's the way to freedom. Christians will be seen as judgmental by a world that doesn't want to be confronted with sin, but there are redemptive ways for us to confront it, better ways than we have done in the past. The better way that's offered to us by Jesus that can help others as we help ourselves be made new and whole because we've been set free from sin and death. The Christian's job is to agree with God that every person you meet was worth him dying for. That is the truth that speaks with love. May we believe it and live it. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning humbled by our own sin. As we speak about it this morning, we all know what, what we keep hidden in our own closets, the logs that we pile up. It's so easy for us to look at sin in someone else and point at it. We are blind to our own. Lord, forgive us. Help us to see clearly so that we might help others come to know the freedom and release of salvation in you. Give us a holy boldness. Help us to grow in grace and love. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.